Friends, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. This day is the day that we celebrate Palm Sunday. And I am Pastor Jeffrey Zalatoris, pastor here at Harmony United Methodist Church. We're offering again this Sunday our virtual online worship service. And this day we say Hosanna, a word that means save us, we pray. Indeed, God, Hosanna, save us, we pray this day. And I give thanks to you, God, for our faithful congregation, a people with stamina and perseverance, a people with steadfastness. As we enter this time of worship, I invite all of you to have at your hands a Bible. We'll be reading two passages today. In the Psalms, we'll be reading Psalm 118, verses 19 through 29. And for our Gospel reading, we'll be reading Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Let us begin a time with prayer. Almighty God, we remember this day that your Son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem. He was proclaimed King by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be a sign for us of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In your holy name we pray. Amen. to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.
friends, let's listen to our gospel reading taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Friends, save us, we pray. Hosanna to the highest one. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, would a king bear your burden? What sovereign, what king, what queen would invite you to take a load of your burden that he the king or she the queen would carry it for you? Ponder this as we pray together. God of might, open our eyes and ears and hearts to your kingdom, that may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. It is Palm Sunday. Can you imagine the palms waving the branches in the hands, children and adults parading through aisles and outside the churches, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. Or can you imagine a, a donkey outside the church, or even a donkey walking down the aisle inside of a, of a church? These are scenes we may visualize this, this time of triumph of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But this year I have to ask you to imagine those scenes. You have to imagine them because we are at home and not at church. And even if these scenes of palm branches waving and people parading and even dramatic readings of the palm story and the passion story, even these we cannot offer in our churches where we're used to seeing them and hearing them. But even if we cannot gather in the churches today, we still look to the Palm Sunday and the Passion story readings as worthy of a dramatic flair as ever. For they make an event something to remember. This is a big event. But this year, we make it a smaller event. And this year, by downplaying a bit of the, the extravagance and flair, we focus a little bit more on the details underneath, the details of the story. This year, Palm Sunday will be an event to remember because it is not a big event. This year, Palm Sunday is a quiet celebration. And this gives us an unusual chance to sit with the story, rather than having the story presented to us in a big flourish of drama, but by being quieter and a little smaller, 
we can listen more for the details of the story. But don't get me wrong, this is a very dramatic story. For the drama of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem is high drama, the, the climax of a traveling story. For literally, Jesus and the disciples and others had just physically climbed and hiked a mountain, 4,000 foot elevation change, going from Jericho in the valley up to Jerusalem in the mountains. Some people had been traveling together with Jesus since Galilee. Weeks earlier, they'd been taking their time visiting people, visiting towns, teaching, healing. For Jesus, along this road, had healed the ten lepers. He had healed the blind man on the road to Jericho. He even forgave Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Together, this crowd, they had climbed and ascended from Jericho in the valley up to Jerusalem on the mountains because the Passover festival was at hand. It was time for family and friends to gather together. It was the time to celebrate the liberation, the celebration of God's grace at unburdening the people from their slavery in Egypt. But even Jesus, the disciples, the people even of Jerusalem, they were living under the condition of a Roman occupation and living under Roman law. They were even living under the rule of a despotic king, Herod. They would gather to remember, though. They would remember God's grace at unburdening their ancestors. But in this time of Jesus, neither the Romans nor Herod's family cared for the common person. The Romans and Herod only cared for keeping their own power, their control, their personal safety intact. They ruled not for the people, nor did they rule to bear the burdens of their people. But the Romans and Herod ruled selfishly for themselves alone. Palm Sunday is a dramatic story, and like many dramatic stories, there is a, a moment of relief a moment of success right before the ultimate tragedy, the final tragedy of the story. Palm Sunday is that moment of success right before the tragedy. And so this in one way has the feeling of the climactic moment of the story, yet it raises our hopes so high in celebration that the tragedy that follows is devastating. This is our Holy Week. This is a form of storytelling that is common through ancient time up to the present, and theater productions are well known for sharing stories in this very manner. One of my favorite theater productions is the musical Into the Woods. This is a musical that is set in the village where fairy tale characters live. Characters like Little Red Riding Hood and Cinderella and Jack and the Beanstalk. And the musical Into the Woods asks the question of these fairy tale characters, what really happened when they say, live happily ever after? Because these characters, because they are shown to be driven by their selfish desires in the first act, that they get what their greedy little hearts desire by deceit, by lying, by thievery, by disobedience. And it feels like in that musical that right before intermission, everything is good because they get what they want. The end of the act concludes on the high note. They lived happily ever after. And then after intermission, tragedy strikes. Tragedy strikes over and over. The consequences of the selfish desires, the sins, the immorality of the characters takes its toll. Injuries, destruction of property, even death befall the villagers. All looks futile and lost until they start to work together. Until they bear each other's burdens, all seems lost. But when they bear, bore each other's burdens, they could come together and reach a conclusion where there was 
peace at the end. It is a story where the ending is not a raucous celebration, but a story of relief. Relief that you feel when you've confessed of your sins and are told those words, your sins are forgiven. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, it's like that point right before intermission, where some success is about to happen, but there will be a tragedy that follows. Jesus enters the gate to the city of Jerusalem, sitting astride one donkey, we hear, leading a second donkey, a colt, alongside. And Jesus had ascended from the Jordan Valley, entering the gates of the city. It's a kingly procession. It seems like everything's going to be happily ever after. Yet you and I know the tragedy will strike. We know the story. Besides, there are too many pages in Matthew's Gospel afterwards for the story to end as Jesus enters Jerusalem. And this Sunday, we look at these details. Details we don't always look at on Palm Sunday, but today we get the chance to look at some of the details. Because the details tell us the story is not over. Today, even though there are many details, today the one we'll look at is the details of the donkeys that Jesus enters on. He enters Jerusalem riding a donkey with another beside him. This tells us Jesus' story is not over. Jesus enters Jerusalem riding the donkey, bringing alongside the, the colt, the younger donkey, Jesus did not carry anything with him. His burden was already light, but he rode one pack animal and brought alongside a second, an unencumbered beast of burden with him. And the Gospel of Matthew tells us this was done to fulfill the prophecy. It says, Your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Yet Matthew is quoting text from the prophet Zechariah, but Zechariah gives a little bit more to that text than what Matthew teaches us. For Zechariah in the prophecy also includes this, saying, it is triumphant and victorious. You see, Zechariah makes it clear that this is a successful king having achieved the happily ever after part of the story. In full, Zechariah reads like this. Your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding the donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah is confident. Matthew is not. Matthew doesn't give us that confidence that the story is over because he doesn't use those words, triumphant and victorious is he, and by this omission, Matthew's Gospel says the story isn't over. There is more to come. So Jesus enters Jerusalem's gates. But does he do this just to fulfill a prophecy? I suspect there's more to the story. So what else do we learn from Old Testament readings to help us understand what it means to enter Jerusalem on a donkey? Well, when King David was exiled after his son Absalom overthrew the kingdom, David was given a donkey by a family nearby and given enough donkeys for his traveling companions that their burdens would be borne as they rode away from Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives and down to the Jordan River. In that story, the donkey served David at the time of David's humiliation and shame. The donkey bore not only the ex-king's burden, but the burden of those who joined the king in exile. Perhaps then, Matthew wants us to look at David's story and to see how Jesus' ascent from the Jordan River Valley and riding the donkey over the Mount of Olives and through the gates of Jerusalem is the symbolic reversal 
of David's shame, the return of the king from exile. Or when David's son, Adonijah, tried to take the throne when David was near death, David instructed the prophet Nathan and the priest Zadok to anoint his son Solomon as king. And when his son Solomon was anointed, he then rode his father's donkey up from the valley where he was anointed and into Jerusalem so that the people would proclaim, long live King Solomon and end the usurper's attempt at the throne. Does Jesus' entry into Jerusalem then remind us of the people of Solomon's anointing the king and his procession on a donkey to prevent the usurper from the throne? Or does the donkey represent a time of humble kings, people like David who worked with and for the subjects of the land, for their good and not for his own personal selfish greed? Sure, David had his moments of selfishness, we know this. We know he had moments of greed and lust and sin, but even with those moral failings, David asked for God's forgiveness. And he had a heart for the people, he had a heart for their safety to serve them, that they not be harmed. David's kingship was remembered as a time for the average common person to thrive and not to be abused by the powerful. And even in Jesus' own time, we know historically the horses were ridden by the Romans and by King Herod. Horses pulled military chariots. Horses were the emblem of power and might and oppression. But Jesus did not enter Jerusalem on a horse. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, the humble beast of burden. But what about the second donkey, the young one, the colt? Why bring that beast of burden as well as the one Jesus himself rode into Jerusalem? Was that done simply again to follow Zechariah's prophecy, or did the prophecy have something more to it? Perhaps Jesus brought the young donkey, donkey as a backup, an insurance policy for the future, as if to say, look to the future. I ride this donkey, I am prepared to mount the next one when it is time. My future is not temporary, but it is everlasting. Or perhaps Jesus brought the second donkey because it can carry other people's burdens. That Jesus is prepared to carry your burdens if he saw you in need. For remember, Jesus spoke these words in his days of ministry. Come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus had been teaching that he came not to burden us, but to unburden us. And if we are yoked with Jesus, the work he asks of us will be more than made up by the lightening of our heavy burdens when he assumes the weight from us. So imagine you are being invited to put some of your gear, your cares, your anxieties, your worries and fears, and to put your griefs on the back of the colt riding alongside Jesus. That Jesus will bear those burdens for us as he goes through the town of Jerusalem and beyond. As king, Jesus was not putting burdens onto people. Instead, Jesus was inviting the people to place their burdens with him. Now, I don't know the full reason for Jesus entering Jerusalem on one donkey and leading a second donkey beside it. But the story gives me hope that Jesus is King and Lord, that Jesus is not going anywhere away from us, 
that Jesus' story of entering Jerusalem was not the end point, but that Jesus was and is preparing for the future, a future with us, a future in which he will willingly bear some of the weight of our burdens. It is a future in which the remainder of Zechariah's prophecy would be fulfilled, that after we hold our breaths collectively through the Holy Week time and the tragedy of Jesus' crucifixion, but then the King will come. That Easter morning, triumphant and victorious, and still humble, Jesus will return ready to bear your burden. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. pray our prayer of confession this day. Merciful God, we confess our foolish and stiff-necked ways. We have turned against you when you have asked us to obey. We have sinned against you in the things we have done. Forgive us, we pray, and unburden us from the chains of sin that we may serve you freely. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, Amen. For a deepening renewal of faith in Gaia, to guide our lives and to unburden the weights upon our hearts and souls, God, in your gift, goodness, have mercy on us. For the wisdom to witness your works of creation and acts of grace, and the courage to share God's signs with our neighbors. God, in your goodness, have mercy on us. For the healing of bodies and minds, the healings of families, and the healings of communities, and for the safety of our first responders, providers, 
and health care workers. God, in your goodness, have mercy on us. For the petitions on your heart, For God's blessings, healings, compassions, and mercies, God, in your goodness, have mercy on us. Friends, we continue to offer support to one another as we are a church called to share God's love with each other, the community, and the world. And for us to continue serving in that mission, I invite you this week to make an offering that is an offering to our God and our Savior, an offering that we may continue to serve as we, as Harmony, have been called to serve. Visit our website to, to make an online donation, or send a check to the church, or drop one off at the church as well. Let us pray, then, for this offering that we give this week. Holy God, your grace gives us life and restores our souls. As a vibrant and virtual community in worship, we praise your holy name and offer you our thanks, our gifts, and our service. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let us now join our voices together and offer this prayer, the prayer that you taught us. We offer this with the confidence of the children of God, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Friends, let us go through this week, preparing our hearts to receive the Christ. That we will go through the remainder of the story, this dra drama of Jesus' week, this holy week. But go, knowing that God has come to save you and to unburden you. Simply let yourself be unburdened. Let Jesus be yoked to you. Friends, go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.